Hallelujah. Right. I completely am thrown onto the grace of the Lord because I cannot see. I've come without my glasses. You know I'm in denial, don't you? And some of the glasses I've got, I've got string holding them on and I just think uh, you wouldn't be able to concentrate on what I'm saying for laughing at what I've got on my head. So uh, let's go with the Lord, eh? So this morning I want to talk about strategic wisdom. I think that's up there. Yeah, strategic wisdom. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> this makes it a bit worse. So uh, I'll trust in the Lord. So I wanted to, you, you, if you've got a Bible or you have, turn to Colossians 4.2. And I'm actually reading from the text and trying to do, split the text up into three pieces. And it's this, continue steadfastly in prayer. Okay, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So three things there we want to draw out. It's prayer, watchfulness, and thanksgiving. Now, first of all, let's talk about the first point. It's continuing steadfastly in prayer. What is prayer? What is prayer? Well, many people pray. Maybe we call it meditation or whatever. But for us, we have direct access to the Father through the merits of what Jesus done on the cross. Through his blood, he tore the veil in two and we have access directly into that holy place where the priest went once a year to access God's presence. For us, the access is in our hearts. The spirit of the living God is indwelling us and when we pray and lift up our hearts, we have a connection with him that is unique to any other religion. It is an amazing thing. Prayer, then, is an experience that we can all have. And what is it? That God wants us to experience his presence daily, continually, throughout our Christian walk. God wants us to meet with him in communion, in connection with the Father, with him, with you. We can talk about this all day and uh, we can... Sorry, I can't see. <laughs> we can talk with him all day, sorry. And we can find his comfort. We can find his peace. We can find his joy. We can find his empowerment in our daily walk. But I want to be honest with you. Prayer can be very difficult. Prayer can be hard because it's... Sometimes you just feel like you're saying words. There's no connection. And it's difficult to press through. And that's when a lot of Christians give up. Oh, I'm getting nowhere with this. It's difficult. It's too hard. I find it really dry. I'm just saying words. God isn't listening to me. That's a test of your faith. You've got to talk with God. You've got to connect with him. You've got to press through some of that stuff. And keep in connection with him. Jesus said man ought to always pray and not faint, not give up. Keep in prayer. Paul teaches us to continue in our prayer life, i.e. devote ourselves to it. Yes, it is hard and it is tough, but devote yourself to it. Yes, it's a devotion. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, and verse 10, prayed three times a day. Right at the very beginning of Daniel, when he was in difficulties in Babylon and all the pressures that were coming upon him to compromise... What he did with his friends was decided to devote himself to the things of God and not to compromise. And so the story unfolds that they didn't and they were challenged by it, but they came through. And part of his devotion was his prayer life. And he prayed three times a day. He went up into his bedroom, opened the window and pray, prayed. Even when there was an edict, edict given that anybody who prayed to their God would be killed and killed in a horrible way, i.e. thrown into the lion's den. So what Daniel did, he ignored that and continued to pray against all the odds because he was devoted to it, committed to it, and God brought him through. We know the story, then we shut the lion's mouths. So are we continuing steadfastly in prayer? 
Even in dangerous times, do we continue to pray? Even when it's difficult, do we continue to pray? Because that's something that God wants us to do. The early church in Acts 2.42, it says that they devoted themselves, listen carefully to this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to breaking of bread, and to prayer. So the early church devoted themselves to those few things. And this morning, you're listening to God's word. We are praising and worshipping together. We're doing communion. It's part of what the church did. And then the apostles. In Acts 6.4, it says the 12 apostles uh, of the early church, this is the disciples that were, it says we will continue ourselves, to. Pr- we will devote ourselves continually to prayer, and to the ministry of the word. You know, the ministry of the word is empowered through prayer. The ministry of the word and whatever you're doing is empowered through prayer. Jesus was the master of prayer, wasn't he? He showed us. He he came from heaven's glory, but he showed us as a man that in his difficulties and his problems through the day, he would often separate himself and pray and find the connection with his father and be empowered. And that's sometimes what we have to do. Let's come away from a lot of the stuff that we're going through and just get with God and let him empower us. The same word is used for devotion and dedicated. When Jesus said to, uh, I think it was Peter, in in Mark 3 verse 9, he said, devote this boat so that I can use it. Isn't that strange? Devote a boat? Set it apart. Because the crowds are coming and they need to hear the word. I need this boat dedicated, separated. And that's what we do when we pray. We dedicate ourselves. We separate ourselves. We pray. John Piper, to quote, says this. I have often said that one of the reasons we feel so weak in prayer, in our prayer lives, is that we have tried to make a domestic intercom out of a wartime walkie-talkie. Prayer is not designed as an intercom between us and God to serve our domestic comforts. Okay? It's designed as a walkie-talkie on the spiritual battlefields. It's linked between the active soldiers and their commanding headquarters with its unlimited firepower, its air cover, and its strategic wisdom. St. Paul used that strategy when he called for the church to pray for him. He said in Ephesians 9, he says, Pray for me that I might with all boldness declare God's word fully. He called for air cover. He called for the prayers of the saints. Prayer is important, so we continue steadfastly in prayer. That's what Paul commissioned and commended us to do. And that's what the word is around this morning, that we devote ourselves. Have you stopped praying? Have you pulled back from your prayer life? Have you gone one week without meeting with God? One week without prayer makes a saint. What, one day without, is it, what is, one? One day without prayer makes one week. Yes, one day without prayer makes one week. Yeah. Okay, so... If we've got that continuing prayer, and from that position of prayer, Paul says we need to be watchful, okay? Keeping alert whilst we're in prayer. Uh, This is very important, I think, and something I've learned to do, and sometimes I haven't done, and it's been very catastrophic. Uh, It's a present tense, okay? It's like a person pulling themselves out of sleep. I was dossing on the settee yesterday, in and out of consciousness. (laughs) tired from the week's work but it was difficult to pull myself out of that slumber to watch the coronation I was tired so what we're saying here Paul says pull yourself out of the sleep and be alert be awake be aware what's going on you know the flesh continually is fighting to keep us in a state of sleepiness Oh, don't bother oh just lie in oh don't don't pray just get on with it have your breakfast and go to work It's always good to pray. Start the day with prayer. How are we to be watching then? Well, Nehemiah is a wonderful example. He set his men on the wall, building the wall. The the walls of Jerusalem have been pulled down through the 
through uh, the, the invasion of uh, near my, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and they destroyed the place. And so when they were coming back from captivity, ne Nehemiah's work was to build the walls that had been pulled down. But he had opposition. There's always opposition when we set ourselves out to serve the Lord, you know. There's always opposition when we step forward to serve Christ. There's always opposition when you give your heart to Jesus. Straight away, the enemy's on your case. And Nehemiah set a watch. He got his men with spears and swords, and they were working with spears and swords at a trowel. I've never done that before. <laughs> but they worked with spears and swords and trials, and they prayed with their eyes open. So a continual prayer. Pray in all circumstances. Pray when you're driving. Pray when your eyes are open. Keep in connection with God. That's what he's saying. And be watchful because the enemy is going to come and try to stop you from doing what you're doing. He's going to come at you by many ways. Through people. Through situations. You've got to stand with your spear, your sword, your trowel. You've got to work. Do the job. He says, you're not going to stop us because we're doing a great work. Are you doing a great work for God? Are you doing something for the Lord? Or are you messing about to sleep? Wake up and serve the Lord. So Nehemiah gives us a great example. And now how are we to keep alert then watching today? Well, number one, I put here, personally. In two ways. A, by looking from your prayer life and looking around and seeing what God is doing. Have you ever done that? Oh, God is in this. God's opening a door here. You know, the Bible, well, we say, the world is saying, God is in the detail. Very often we've got to be aware that God is actually moving in your life. Oh, God's in this. David was anointed king. He had all this wood coming from Hiram, higher up. They were sending all the logs down. And he said... I discern that the Lord is actually with me. I thought David already knew that. But sometimes through circumstances, we can recognise that God is actually working with you. But from that prayer life, you've got to discern it and look around and see God in it. Or is God shutting the door? Do you know God opens doors? It says he opens a door that no man can shut. And he shuts a door that no man can open. So sometimes through circumstances, God is working and blocking you. He blocked St. Paul from going into a certain place to preach the gospel, trying to do God's will. God blocked him and diverted him into another place. But Paul recognised it. He saw it spiritually. Oh, God is closing the door here. And he had a vision and somebody from Mesopotamia said, come over here. Do we recognise when God is shutting a door or opening a door? We get that when we prayerfully look in and listening and keeping alert. B, part of this watching, is looking from your prayer life and recognising Satan. A lot of us don't recognise his working. The Bible talks we are not unaware of his schemes. Satan schemes. How does Satan scheme against you? Well, he schemes against you by bringing division. He divides the church. He messes about with us. He causes arguments. He causes us to be falling out with each other. And there we lose the blessing of the Lord. And the church is connect, focusing on falling out, trying to get the better over each other. You've got to be aware of that, friends, that Satan works in such subtle ways. It isn't always like tingles and funny feelings and creepiness. He's working against us to dislodge our faith, to disconnect you from God, and to send you off a spiral where you're focusing on things that are not right. So you've got to be aware. If there's something going on and you see there's an argument starting, you recognise who's behind it and stop it. The Bible says often a soft word turns away wrath. Sometimes humility, even though you're right, can change everything. I've experienced that many times. And you win the battle by the spiritual principle. So be aware what Satan is doing. Okay, so uh, Jesus said we need to be aware of the times. And if, any, if there's any time in history, we need to be aware today. I'm watching lots of things. You've got to watch the conspiracy theories. You've got to pull all that out and chuck it out. 
but I am alert to things that connect me to the second coming of Jesus, to the last days. We've seen wars, rumours of wars. We see nations rising up against nations. We see continents and nations at unrest. Wow. Do we see that in France? Are we seeing it here in Britain? Are we seeing it in the Ukraine? And then there's ideologies all around the place. Things happening. So we've got to be aware. Jesus said you can discern the weather by looking at the sky. Are we looking spiritually at the sky of what's happening around us today? I was watching the other day, yesterday, a young man named Josh was being arrested in Canada in Montreal, is it? And he was 16 years old. He'd only said something in his class. He said there's only two genders. And he tried to go back to his class and they barred him and said, you're trespassing. And there were six police officers with guns handcuffing him in the public area, in the street. He was just like a lamb, just went. What's, what's happening, friends, in our society? There's a dark cloud arising rising on the horizon. It's affecting our institutions, our schools, our colleges, our universities. It's crept into our establishments and sadly it's dividing the church. It's challenging biblical truth. I'm going to name it. It's the vile ideologies of woke and stonewall. It's coming in, friends. And we cannot compromise God's word. It will separate the church. It will divide us. It will be like the virgins that have not got the oil in the lamp. It'll be like the Lord returning and we're not ready. Are we ready? Are we looking? Are we looking for Jesus to be coming? Another one that we've got to watch is this AI. Artificial intelligence. And that was a warning this week on the main news from the guy who started it and started and invented it. He said, I'm warning us about the AI. It is going to take over. That's all part of what's coming, friends. And Satan is bringing it together. And if as a church and the church people, we're not aware of it, we'll fall for it. Some churches have, sadly. Let's keep with God's word. One thing about yesterday's coronation was thrilled me is that they said on the TV that it's, it's deeply rooted in the Old Testament. That it goes back to Solomon's coronation, the anointing of Solomon under the Lord. And there he was being anointed. And there he was being given the very oracles of God. Placing his hand on it. What an absolute fantastic thing that was. But the only problem is... We see that it is very Christian, but how long will it stay Christian? Because already there are other faiths creeping in. I know that we're to be tolerant and we're to be understanding, but when something like this is going to be watered down and divided and moved by multi-faith, we've got to watch it. We've got to watch it. Let's keep it Christian. And I want to move on. If we've got prayerfulness, watchfulness, we've got thankfulness. Right, it's important to our spiritual life to be thankful. Isn't it hard to be around people who are constantly complaining? Yeah. And the, the Australians call us the whinging palms, that we're whinging about the weather, that we whinge about this and that we complain about that. And that can be a mindset and that can be from our old nature and that we can be just constantly complaining the food's not hot enough, this isn't good enough, that job's been done wonderful, but it's this I can see there. You can be on and on and be complaining. But we are called to be a people of thankfulness. It's discouraging to be brown people who are constantly complaining. Israel fell into that trap when they were tested. Sometimes we're tested. And somebody said to us on a job that we keep having to go back to, some things come along to test us. <laughs> How do we... Stand up against the test. Do we complain and whinge? Or do we see God in it and do we worship him? There's something about thankfulness and gratitude that changes our perspective. And it changes our attitude and altitude. If we're constantly looking down and moaning, that's where we're going to be dwelling. But if we look up and, and start to worship God and start to see God, our attitude and altitude changes. Yeah. 
Psalm 93, verse 3, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will, ac- I will account of all his wonderful deeds. With my whole heart, I will worship God. I will look back in the past and say, God worked for me there. God worked for me there. God did this here. This is what Israel did. This is what the psalmist is doing. He's looking back and saying, he brought us through the Red Sea, delivered us out of Egypt. He saved us. And this problem that we've got now, God will work in it. And so with my whole heart, I worship God in this situation. Psalm 86 verse 12, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my whole heart, and I will glory in your name forever. Do we glory in God? Are you glorying in God this morning, or are you glorying in something else? The psalmist gloried in God. He gloried and worshipped him. Something that praise does then, just a few things quickly before I finish. Praise brings us into God's presence. Okay, yep. God, praise brings us into God's presence. The scripture for this is Psalm 23, verse 3. You are holy. You are enthroned in the praises of Israel. God inhabits the praises of the people. God's presence comes down as we worship him. He doesn't need praise. The whole universe declares his glory. But there's something about his people when we worship him that brings his presence down. He's enthroned in our presence. He dwells in it. He manifests himself when the praises begin to rise. He doesn't when the grumbling's there and when the division's there. But when the praises of God's people arise, he inhabits them. So praise brings us into God's presence as well. Psalm 100 100 verse 4 and verse 5, it says, Enter, oh I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy endures from everlasting to everlasting to all generations. How do you enter into God's presence? How are we entering in? Well, if we enter in with praise, there's a connection straight away because God inhabits it. So we enter into his presence with praise and with worship. Did you know that it's actually your clothing I've got this jacket on, you've got your clothes on, but there is a spiritual clothing that we have, and it's our praise. Okay? Isaiah says this. He says this in 61 verse 3. You have given us the oil of joy for mourning. This is the Lord Jesus. This is prophetic speaking of Christ. 700 years before he came. You have given us the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We would say today, heaviness is depression. When we begin to praise the Lord, it lifts. Have you experienced that? When you start to worship God, but despite how you feel, that depression lifts. Let faith arise, Moses said, and let the enemies of God be scattered. When they came back to the camp with the ark of the Lord, he said, come back, Lord. Let faith arise in your heart. Don't be under the circumstances. Let faith rise you above them and just give it to us. So actually, when you're worshipping the Lord, you're aligning with him against what's happening in your life. You're actually saying God is above this and I'm worshipping him anyway. Because God will work it out eventually for you. And it's good to come through worshipping him. Yes, it's our clothing. When we wear the garment of praises... <laughs> Depression departs. Another scripture says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise is good and upright and beautiful. God says it's beautiful. When you praise, you put on the garment of praise, you're looking your spiritual best. You've got your tuxedos on. There's something about praise and worship when you've been in the presence of God that affects other people. Somebody said to me the other week when I'd came into one of the meetings. He said, have you been up the mountain top, Chris? Your teeth are white, your face is red as a beetroot. I said, no, I've been in the sun. Physical sun. But isn't it good when you've been in the presence of the Lord and you worship? And there's something about a person that's doing that that affects other people. You are in effect for good. Praise brings victory. Jehoshaphat facing a mighty army, coming against them to destroy and wipe out Israel. They were like a massive encampment. Coming around to face, facing them was like, wow, thousands of camels, thousands of donkeys, soldiers, uncountable. 
coming to destroy. They were walking all over their fields, over their crops, and then they were going to come in and annihilate them and take them off as slaves. Wow, are we facing that kind of thing today? Did he send in the tanks? Did he send in the artillery? He hadn't got it. He says, we can't do anything against this massive army. I don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, Lord. And what the encouragement from the prophets were, send in Judah. Let them go in praising God. Wow, do you do that with a big army? That seems crazy, but sometimes the strategies of God are crazy. And so when he went in and sent in Judah, that means praise. Judah went in praising and the priest went in saying, God is good. God is good. His love endures forever. And as they began to praise, the enemy turned on each other. They were thrown into confusion. So worship confuses the enemy. Why does it confuse him? Because he's got a strategy against you. When you start to praise God, you're aligning yourself with God who's got the answer. And when God sees the praises, he moves. Impossible things. They all turned on each other and legged it. And there was a great victory. And finally, praise is a sacrifice, friends. David said, I will not give unto the Lord that which costs me nothing. Oh, praise is costly. Because you don't feel like it. You can come into church, you're carrying, you got up out of the bed the wrong way, you've had an argument with somebody, you know, things aren't going as you want them. But when you come in to God's presence, come with an attitude that I'm going to worship God. I know it's going to cost me. I don't feel like it, but when I do, you're blessed. The church is blessed. When do we praise? Every day. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Okay, let's finish then with a quick summary. Staying devoted to prayer. Keep at it. And from that prayer place, from that praying, be watchful. Look around. See how, the, how God is moving in your life. See what he's doing. And see what the enemy's doing. Discern it through prayer. And in all that, through all your circumstances and difficulties, worship the Lord, praise him. It's a strategy against the enemy. It brings victory. It brings blessing. It moves you into an attitude that's different. It lifts the depression out of your heart. It connects you with God. So that's your strategy for this morning. May God bless us as we worship God, as we praise him, as we look to him in all our circumstances. Even though the difficulties are there, even though it seems that God's shutting a door on you, he isn't really, but God loves you passionately, he's actually probably diverting you. And maybe Satan is working against you through division, rubbing you against brothers and sisters and causing a, a division of arguments, then recognise that and say, I'm going to change this. You know, reconciliation, sometimes it takes one person. We're reconciled to God. Did we reconcile ourselves to God? No. God reconciled himself to us through his son first. We love him because he first loved us. So God took the first move. Wow. Sometimes we've got to make the first move in a row that's going on and humble ourselves, as we said at the beginning, and just give a kind word. You'll see it change the whole situation. I was in an argument with a neighbour for years. It was fisticuffs. It was constantly tit for tat. And one day I read the scriptures, kind word turns away wrath. And the kids had done something, really annoyed them, wound them up. So here we go again. Right, so I get my, my fighting gloves on. No, I sent the kids around. I said, just go and say sorry. So they went around and said sorry. And that diffused the whole thing. The next thing, he came around with yogurts and, and things from Wincanton. And, and he said, this is for the kids and this is for you. It changed everything. We were friends after that. Even his wife used to hate me so with a passion. I'd be in the house cup of tea and talking. A simple thing, a biblical principle, enacted by faith, changed a, warf a warfare that was going on for a long time. Are you needing to do something to change the war that's going on? Are you seeing Satan moving against you in a situation? Then take a biblical principle and fight him with it. Sometimes love diffuses things. As Christians, we're called to love one another, yeah? 
You know, the, the Quran says fight and turn and bind and twist. And that's the core of the Quran. And that's why we see a lot of the problems we've seen with the bombs and everything that are going off with the people who are fanatics. But this morning, the core center of Christianity is love your neighbor as yourself. And humility, when God sees humility in due time, he'll lift you up. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody, I don't know, who's listening on the line. You're in a situation and God's wisdom is for you to move in biblical principle and fight it with love and fight it with humility and fight it with a kind word and you'll see God change everything. Our relationship was far better. There was peace. There was no more war. <laughs> but I had to take the move and you have to take the move. So see what God's doing from your prayer life. See where is, what's happening and see if God's moving for you. And thank him all the time, continually, because he's got the plan. He's got it. He knows what's the beginning from the end. And you might be going through a hard time now, a difficulty. But you've got to keep praising him because eventually he'll come through. What have I got to learn through this, Lord? What have I got to learn through this difficulty? Teach me, show me. What are you saying to me? through the situation I'm going through. What have I got to learn? Is it like a piece of sand and it's rubbing you up and you, you create a pearl out of it? Maybe the situation's getting to you. See what God's saying to you. Speak to me, Lord, in this situation. I could give you many stories about things that have changed things through humility, but you've got to do it today. Amen.